Uh, good evening, and welcome to the Cree Society's program series, Startup Scenes, Entrepreneurs of Tomorrow. I'm Tom Byrne, President and CEO of the Cree Society, and so I welcome your coming over here this evening. I would like to begin tonight's program by expressing our heartfelt gratitude to Hanwha Life, uh, the exclusive sponsor of the Startup Scenes series. Hanwha's generous support has made it possible for this series to offer inspiration, knowledge, and networking opportunities to startup entrepreneurs. Tonight, we are pleased to present Curtis Lee, VP of Global Payments and Cash in Microsoft. His current role at Microsoft is remarkable, but Curtis joins us tonight not as a representative of Microsoft. Tonight, he is wearing his entrepreneur cap and, sh and will share his experience as a seasoned startup entrepreneur. With the Startup Scene initiative, we aim to offer practical insights that budding entrepreneurs actually need. One of the pivotal, pivotal questions that we uh, encountered is how to navigate through an established career path um, while pursuing entrepreneurial aspirations. With a rich diversity of experiences spanning major tech giants, startups, and investment firms, Curtis is uniquely positioned to shed light on critical decision making. Curtis has over 20 years of experience in technology as an entrepreneur, executive, and, and investor. Prior to his current role at Microsoft, Curtis was a serial entrepreneur, founding two companies, Pinwheel, the leading income and employment data API company, and Lux, a mobility software and services company, which was acquired by Volvo. Earlier in his career, Curtis led product teams at Google, YouTube, Groupon, and Zigna, and was an investor at Summit Partners and ATV. Curtis holds an MBA from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania and a BA in economics from UC Berkeley. Moderating tonight's program is Stefan Kim, ABC News correspondent and WABC TV reporter. Uh, Stefan has covered major national events from the pandemic shutdown to issues within the AAPI community. Safan's journalistic talents have been recognized by the prestigious Edward R. Murrow Award, and he has won multiple Emmys. He is an active member of the Asian, Asian American Journalists Association, mentoring aspiring journalists and promoting media integrity. Without further ado, let's extend a warm welcome to Curtis and Safan as they take us through this evening. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Serial entrepreneur. I didn't know that was a thing. Is that really a thing? I guess so, right? Okay. <laughs> so your your resume is longer than a K drama. So instead of like going through the whole thing, I'm just gonna have you sort of walk us through it, right? Yeah. So I always think it's important to know where you're from. You're from L LA, right. an LA guy in New York. How did an LA guy end up in New York? And it was a long journey, but walk us through that. Have you heard of the term happy wife, happy life? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's how I ended up in New York. My wife, who's actually right there, um, she, okay. uh, she's from the area and she wanted to be back. Make sure she's okay. <laughs> Food, water, you're good? You're good? Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. But, you know, I love New York. It's like the amount of energy here. And what was interesting is we came here about six years ago. And um, sort of at that time, I noticed a kind of shift happening within Silicon Valley where all the startup activity was based there. And then it started to move and disperse. And, you know, obviously COVID helped with that dispersion. But particularly in the New York area, there was a lot of uh, fintech and finance related industry technologies that were sprouting up along with fashion and others. So it was, a, it was sort of a serendipitous uh, you know, reason for me to be here. Interesting. You studied at Berkeley, right? Yeah. What did you study there? Study economics. Yeah. What made you decide to study economics besides <laughs> your parents? That's basically it. You know, <laughs> Nailed so, it. Okay, good. You know, uh, just to kind of go into a little bit about my background, I grew up in L.A., uh, son of uh, two Korean immigrants who, um, who immigrated to L.A., and, uh, and similar to a lot of, I think, people here, people that are uh, watching, you know, when you come from an immigrant sort of mentality, you know, I think this notion of like trying to be conservative, do what is right. There's a step process to, to be successful. Go do go get great, good grades, go to a good school, get, go get a good job and stay on this path. And, you know, at the time when I graduated, I'm obviously dating myself here, but like in the late 90s, early 2000s, the, the thing that everyone wanted to do at the time was to do investment banking or consulting. Yeah. And, and so what I ended up just doing is following the crowd to go into those areas regardless if I enjoyed it or not. Yeah. Did and you enjoy it? 
I, you know, I did. I really enjoyed um, economics, but I think in hindsight, I probably would have done something different. What would you have done? I probably would have done something more like computer science, which I, I minored in, but I didn't okay. do it full time. Why would you have done that differently? Just because if I knew what um, my job eventually would be in my career, having the ability to create things, I think fundamentally being creative and creating things is like something that's within my DNA. And it's also the reason why I made a career change later on in life. Okay, we'll get to that. There's a lot more to the story before we get there though, right? So then you shoot over to the East Coast, you get your MBA at Wharton, heard of it. Um, what was that like? I mean, that's opposite sides of the country here. Yeah. And why continue, I guess, grad school? Honestly, I wish there was a better answer, but it's like exactly what I just told you, right? It's, <laughs> you're it's, a good Asian. I'm, I'm on this raft, right? Think about it as you're on this boat, right? It's like the, uh, the success river that you kind of go on, you hop on, and the next thing you do is you go get an MBA. The funny thing is I'm actually uh, like a guest lecturer often at UPenn. Okay. And I go back and uh, a lot of the teachers ask me to teach classes around entrepreneurship. And they always ask me, how was your time there? I was like, well, I had a lot of fun. <laughs> I don't know if it was necessarily the greatest use yeah. of time or money, right. but I had a lot of fun doing it. And so I think in hindsight, would I have done it? I'm not entirely sure. Right. But it did allow me to go through a career switch, which was, yeah. which was you know. And while you asked me to come back once, and I said that too, and never went back again. They yeah. never asked me again. So <laughs> did something wrong there. So then you did sort of, I guess, what's expected, and you end up going back west to Silicon Valley. Walk us through that part. Yeah, so, you know, I, I went back and I did the thing that I, I said all the kids wanted to do at the time, which was I went back and became an investment banker. So I focused on tech M&A in particular, and then eventually that then led to the next thing you do as a M&A person, which is, or banker, which is you find a way to get out because the hours are gruesome, and then you go and join a PE fund, which is what I did at going to Summit and then eventually ATV. So... You know, it was sort of like the up until I'd say the first five years of my career were pretty cookie cutter. Okay. Uh, and I think, you know, when I look around and I, I talk to particularly like Asian entrepreneurs or people like that, we have a pretty common story. And I think that is a story that okay. you kind of just do what is asked. And the funny thing is I made a conscious effort when I graduated from business school not to be one of those people because yep. I saw that, right? I, everyone sort of did the same thing. They wanted to go to hedge funds or PE firms or whatever it was. And I think I was the only person in my graduating class who had experience in private equity that didn't return to it. I want to sort of hone in on that part, right? So all, all, up until now, we talk about sort of following, I guess, this plan, this, this, the flow. But you sort of hinted at, for the first time, wanting to break off from that. Is that something that was always sort of inside you or did that develop at some point in your path? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, when I was younger, I always had an entrepreneurial spirit. You know, I, 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 sut, I sold, sold Cutco knives, if anyone's familiar with that. Yes. You kind of go door to door. Yes. You know, I had this like, you know, plumbing business that I was like trying to clean toilets and do a bunch of stuff that I would go around the neighborhood doing. So it's always been within my DNA. And then I, I saw like my parents who are entrepreneurs in their own right. And then... What did your parents do, by the way? Yeah. So, you know... It's interesting. I think a lot of immigrants, like my dad graduated from Seoul National and oh, then wow. ended up transferring to yeah. UCLA actually to finish his degree. Wow. And, you know, the funny thing is, it's like, like a lot of immigrants, they, they have these like sort of well-educated, prestigious yeah. experiences in Korea. And then when they come over to the United States, a foreign country, they sort of have to do what they can do at right. the time. And so this was like in the 60s and 70s. And so you know, my dad ended up doing a bunch of like sort of odd jobs around and then eventually started his own business, like an imports expert. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So going sort of back to the other question, was there this yearning desire to do something different at some point? Yeah. So, you know, the turning point was right before I graduated, um, I was, sorry, right before I went into business school in 2005, um, I, uh, I got a really terrible call, a call that I wish no one here experiences, which is a call from my mom telling me that my grandma was passing away. She was on her deathbed. And um, up until that point, if you, uh, if you look at my essays and stuff going into business school, it was all about how I wanted to start a venture fund and continue down that path. But, you know, I went down to go see her and, um, you know, she, she held on up until the point that I got there and then she passed away. And all I felt at that time was a sense of like regret. Like, why did I not spend enough time with her? Why didn't I, um, 
you know, and then, and then that sort of regret turns into self-reflection. You start thinking about your own life, you think about everyone around you, and this sort of inner desire of me wanting to go and be creative, start a company, do all that stuff, I thought to myself, I might as well do it now, or if I, if I don't, then I'll never get the opportunity to do this. And um, it's something that, you know, if you listen to like Jeff Bezos or some of these other entrepreneurs, they talk about this too, when you have like this really, especially it's harder, I think when you have like a path that's already planned out for you. But for Jeff Bezos, he talks about how he left D.E. Shaw. And the thing that he thought about was this notion of this regret minimization framework, which is if you're sitting in your deathbed, like at the age of 80 plus, like, do you want to go back and do you want to think to yourself, well, you know, I wish I did this. I wish I did that because those are the things that you'll regret. It's not the things you've done. It's the things that you didn't do. Regret minimization framework. <laughs> it's like only something Silicon Valley could come up with. Um, okay, so do you remember roughly how old you were when this life moment happened to you? Yeah, I was in my late 20s. I was like 26 or 7, okay. something like that. And you figured now was the time. So then Google, Zynga, Groupon. Yeah. Um, we've all heard of that. Uh, tell us what you did there and how, how you got there and how you got out of there, I guess. Yeah, so after business school, I knew that I wanted to be a founder, an entrepreneur, but I didn't, I've never run anything, right? And I was always on the investing side. So I knew there's a couple of things for being a successful founder. One is you need the experience, right? Hands-on experience. The second thing is I was interested in product, product management. So actually going out there and building products. And then the last piece was actually building a network. Right? I think there's some questions that we received here around, like, how do you build a network? Like, going to a place like Google in 2007 was such a hotbed of talent that, you know, the, the people that I ended up starting my company with eventually were a lot of the people from those companies. Interesting. Okay. And then, so then that's where you jump off to co-found Lux Valet. Yeah. For the folks who might not know what that is, explain what Lux Valet was. Yeah, Lux started sort of in that time frame of like DoorDash and Uber, where the idea that you can use your phone, you have the supercomputer in your pocket at all times that tracks your location, that has all this compute power. The idea was how do you blend the offline and online worlds together? And so like an epiphany I had was I was, um, my wife knows this, but we used to, our, our apartment used to face this like empty parking lot in San Francisco and San Francisco at that time, I guess maybe less so now, but was like booming, right? There's like tons and tons of activity. Yet this parking lot, which is in the heart of the city was such a terrible waste of space, right? Like Monday through Friday from nine to five, super, super busy. On the nights it was completely empty, weekends was com completely empty. So the idea really was like, how can you one, create a better user experience around parking? Okay. So the idea basically was that you know, if like we're sitting here and we want to go, uh, we want to go downtown, we would select in our phone and our app the location. And then we, our systems would track your, us right on our phones as we drove down to that location. And by the time you arrive there, there would be a valet, one of our valets to pick up your car and then park the car. I see. The, the thing about it, yes, it was really convenient, better, better user experience, but really the, the sort of secret that I had was this notion of using parking spaces several times, having multiple turnover. So instead of having one parking lot being the determining factor of where to go, now I can use a different parking lot and fill it with daytime traffic or fill it up with nighttime traffic or weekend traffic, thus benefiting the cities and, uh, and users too. So basically where, where others see an empty parking lot, you saw wasted space and an opportunity yeah. to monetize that. Okay, I know that we'll get back to this later, but that was acquired by Volvo before we get there. Then you go and bootstrap another startup, co-found it. Explain to us what pay, a payroll API, pinwheel, what, <laughs> so layman's terms, what is that? Yeah, um, all it means really is like API is just another term for like a, a connection if you want to call it, into a system, a software system. And so what we do is we um, have a system or a connection in place to payroll data. Okay. So if you think about, uh, there's a company called Plaid, which I think some of you may be familiar with. It's now used for everything, right? Around, but it's specific to banking data specifically. So if you want to connect your Venmo account, right? How do they know that you're Safon, right? How do they know that this is your bank account mm -hmm. without you entering all that information in manually? Well, they just ask you to log in with your Bank of America account and it connects it automatically. We do the exact same thing, but for payroll systems. And the reason why that's really important is that you know, 
we can go into this whole thesis, but really, if you think about um, like FICO scores, uh, your credit scores, it's really your, your willingness to pay. It's not your actual ability to pay. And it's based on past historical data. And it's really faulty in times, right? So if you think about immigrants, parents like myself, who don't have any track record of making payments, who come to the United States, but have a good job, they can't get a loan, they can't get a mortgage, they can't do anything. Now, what we want to do is have banks and other financial institutions use that data, the payroll data, to say that you can actually make your mortgage payments. And that's what a lot of banks are using it for. I see. That's a interesting jump from Lux to that. How, how did that happen? So natural, right? Yeah. Parking and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Honestly, I think it's just people ask me, like, how do you figure out ideas, right, yeah. as a founder? And I think if you go into, like, a white board and you just lock yourself into a room and think about ideas, that's the worst way to do it. Uh, it's a surefire way to like have a screwy idea because it'll seem tangible enough that you'll kind of say, okay, like maybe I'll just yeah. do it, but it's not a real problem you know intimately well. By far the best way is to go and actually get deep into a space, hopefully a space that you're extremely passionate about, whatever it is. And what you'll find is like as you go into these spaces is you'll learn so much more about all the ins and outs, what's broken, what works, and you'll find these like gaps. And that's effectively what we did around, you know, when we sold our company Lux to Volvo, we had an HSA account and, um, and people weren't using it. And so, you know, we created this automated way for us to like get HSA deductions and all this other stuff. But through that process, we found out this 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 trap that i just told you around fico scores not being suitable and then that turned into this whole um idea so one thing did sort of lead to another oh in yeah some ways. yeah you sound like one of these guys that have like ideas constantly bouncing around your head is that fair to say yeah so like even when you're in like two feet into one thing your mind's just going and you're finding interesting okay Are you writing down notes all the time when <laughs> all the time happens yeah all the time yeah, yeah. I, I know the type okay so and then while you're chairman at Pinwheel API, you're the VP at Global Payments and Cash in Microsoft. What does that mean? Yeah, it's always people ask me, like, why aren't you running um, Pinwheel? Yeah. And it was always um, how, you know, my wife and I actually, we sort of constructed it together because, you know, ultimately I'm a, a founder at heart. I always have all, all these ideas as we talked about. But the brutal truth about startups is that they're extremely hard. You know, extremely hard. I just saw this uh, interview that uh, Jensen Huang, who's the uh, founder of NVIDIA, which is like the hottest company right now, like, you know, $2 trillion business. He said even, even what he knows now and how successful NVIDIA and, you know, he became, if he was 30 years younger, would he go and start the company? He said, no. <laughs> no. That's crazy, yeah. right? And, and it's because of the sheer amount of, like, the stress, the amount of like pressure, you know, when I was, um, when I was running Lux, I mean, there's a lot of bad things that happened. We had a death, uh, you know, that I had to kind of deal with. One of our valets ended up, um, running, like they got into an accident and then ended up killing somebody. Yikes. And, you know, having that family send me a note and a video of that person's life, basically saying that you're responsible for this death. Like those are the types of pressures you feel yeah. or having to be, you know, like running out of cash, like several times where you have to like basically lay off most of your team, people who are your friends, people who you've, you've built this business with is brutal because you get to know their families and everything like that. So it's just... I remember one day I was sitting in a conference room and I was talking to a coworker of mine and I was like, you know, these days I feel like there's this heavy um, pressure on my chest. I don't know what's going on. And he, uh, he, he witnessed this or he saw this happen to his wife who was also a founder. Yeah. He said, I think you're having a panic attack. And I had no idea around what a panic attack actually meant. But, you know, I went to a doctor and they're like, yeah, you're, you're basically, you're internalizing all this pressure and it's the stress and it's coming out in these forms. Right. That's understandable. And it's a good segue because my next question to you was about Lux and its revenue model and scale. But specifically, a lot of the competition at the same time was struggling and shuttered. But you guys not only did well, you secured Series B funding and was acquired by Volvo Group. So what was your secret to that success? It's funny because, like, again, like I think people think on the outside, OK, success, they look at the outcome. But there's so many hurdles that you have to go along the way. Probably the worst or the most trying 
story I'll tell you about Lux, which is interesting, is you know we we our Series B was um, funded by Hertz, the car rental company. Oh. And their CEO at the time had this idea that they were getting their butts kicked by Uber, right? right? Because no one wanted to rent a car in the city. Why would you go through all that pain? So his idea was basically, how can we use a company like Lux, who has all this technology, the the parking lots and the people, to transform the rental business? So if you wanted to go and rent a car, you just open up your Hertz app, and the car would then arrive by one of our guys, and then you park it and so on, and we would all take care of that. And so it was a big, big deal for us. We, we signed this term sheet for $50 million for a Series B, and we spent a year, year and a half working on this product. Literally a week before this product was supposed to launch, and it was supposed to deliver up to $100 million to a startup. For a startup, that's big, big money. Mm-hmm. And um, a week before the launch, I get a call from the CEO. And he says, um, I have some news to tell you. You're not going to like it. Uh, but I was fired this morning. Oh, and uh, by Carl Icahn, the, the oh, famed... Uh, yeah, who's good at busting up, right. That's what he does, right? He so does, he was yeah. the lead investor at Hertz. He fired him, and then he fired all of his executive right. staff. And so within literally, you know, one blink of an eye, this whole deal that we had went under. So I got calls from, like, my board, what's going on? And then I ended up, you know, ultimately meeting with the person who replaced him. And she said, listen, I, you're a swell guy, but I have no desire to go and... <laughs> start this thing again because yeah. she was in cost cutting mode that's what she was right, hired of course, for right and so you know we ended up having to do one of these rifts where you had to get rid of a lot of the people we transitioned the business from this service based business yeah. which was really costly to one that was more software oriented i see and that ultimately saved us right as we pivoted into that thing and then that's ultimately what volvo uh, found really interesting to I run see. their mobility business how did volvo incorporate that into their so, yeah, I mean, for those who have, uh, for the U.S. at least, if you have a Volvo app or Volvo car, like the entire app itself um, is all run by us, our oh, company. And oh. then for if you want to service your vehicle, instead of going to a physical location, oh. this was something that was a big hit during COVID. They will actually send people to pick up your car and, oh, and service it. They've also used this technology within uh, the European market, which they're obviously uh, big in, to go and power all their mobility services. So um, they have a big car sharing business there, and it's all run on this platform. Okay, makes sense. Um, the art of letting go. <laughs> How did you determine when it was time to exit? You know, they always say, like, companies are not um, sold. They're, like, bought. Uh, and, <laughs> and honestly, it was just, like, I think fortuitous to some extent. But, you know, there's a, a bit of, like, luck and hustle involved because yeah. I think post- transition like we had to figure out what we wanted to do we needed customers right to go and buy this and then we had discussions with a bunch of car oems at the time and um and it was just me you know pounding the pavement talking to them and uh and setting up meetings and then that eventually led to that we had a couple of other uh, car companies who were interested and volvo was the ultimate one any regrets how that all went down looking back I think you always have like regrets, you know, as a, as a founder, as an entrepreneur, right? This is your baby. You, there's all these things in hindsight that look so stupid. Like, why did you do these things? And there's things you wish you could have changed. But I think ultimately, like, it's the journey, right? It's all about the journey itself. And like, you know, I, I still think about, um, I still sometimes wake up in a cold sweat. <laughs> I think about Lux, but no, I mean, it's like, you know, I think, I think a lot of the learnings that I took away from Lux, I brought into Pinwheel. Okay. Namely, the fact that I didn't want to do an offline, online business that involved a lot of logistics and a lot of costs. You know, I think software businesses just allow you to scale significantly better uh, and much, much more cost effective. Okay. And another good segue. So you just sort of mentioned after Lux. After Lux, you shifted gears, became an investor for startup companies. Why? You know... Um, this is interesting. You feel um, after a founder and you, you sell your company, whether it's successful or not, the sale, there's a bit of depression because you're so used to like going to this company, it's yours, and then all of a sudden it's yeah. not yours. It's like anymore. being an empty nester. Yeah, empty <laughs> with nester. With the kids out of the house, now they're yeah, gone. That's exactly what right. What do we do now with all this space? Right, right, right. And then you now have a boss, right, who's telling you to <laughs> right. do stuff with your own product and your team. And it's a bit of, it's depressing. And so, you know, I had to kind of think about what I wanted to do and, um, you know, there's this like sort of old adage of like, you should be giving, not taking, right? And 
that's how I actually dug out of my depression to some extent, which was I, I learned so much over those um, six years that I felt like I had to help people out. And so I started just talking to entrepreneurs, going to events like this. I meet people and some of those turned into um, some folks who had some ideas and they said, hey, I'd love for you to like invest or at least help me out. And I didn't really I wasn't in there to try to make money or try to like get any ownership in the business. It was just me trying to help people out. And the good thing about investing is you sort of build a reputation and you invest in one good business and then it turns into the next and turns into the next and then you're getting pulled in. And so it kind of just fortuitously happened. Interesting. Um, you kind of already mentioned how you came up with payroll API, um, but you initially focused and your co-founders on automated health savings account. <laughs> what is that? Yeah, it was just the idea. There's like sort of the insight that... Um, you know, like people have HSA accounts, which are health savings accounts that a lot of uh, companies offer. And uh, they, go, they go mostly underutilized because they ask you to make an allocation or at least a projection of what you're going to use for that upcoming year. But then you don't use it. And in some cases with FSA, FSAs and whatnot, it goes away. So there's a lot of money that's sort of um, left on the table. And so the idea was really that if we connect your payroll account with our systems, we can flag the, the items that would be HSA eligible. Oh, wow. And then we would then go and automate that reimbursement for you. How did you even come up with the idea that that was a need? <laughs> just we were users. We were like employees oh, at this company. I see. And we just saw this open need. Interesting. Okay, yeah. so here's a good question. Uh, for Pinwheel, you took the role as president and executive chairman, not the CEO. Uh, and now is now as chairman, mm. how do you approach a role as chairman and what implications of lessons from your experience as Lux, as co-founder and CEO, have influenced the structuring of management and governance within Pinwheel? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, uh, maybe I'll take it a little bit more broad, which is like, what would you do with one company that you, <laughs> <laughs> that you could change or avoid with the other? I think, you know, it was honestly, I think we raised too much money too soon for Lux and um, and you sort of get you sort of like fall into the hoopla of like the momentum of like being paraded around all these different investors and you don't really think about what's good for your business. And so I think with Pinwheel, it was like we tried to be a little bit more disciplined on that front. Probably didn't do as good of a job, to be honest, because we raised just the same amount of capital, <laughs> <laughs> but we did it in a much more functional way. And even now, like we're being very lean. You know, people always ask me, what do you need to be, um, like, what are some of the traits that you have to be a, to be a successful entrepreneur? And you have to be relentlessly resourceful. Okay. Like, people who go out and spend a ton of money and, like, before there's actual product market fit, like, they just, those are the ones who ultimately have failed companies. Mm -hmm. And you have to really understand, like, it's, it's so much about just being alive that, that makes the big difference because people always talk about what matters in a business, right? Is it product? Is it market? Is it team? And it's, it's almost always I've noticed around market, right? Like if you, there's a famous um, VC um, firm called Benchmark and like one of their old partners, Andy Ratcliffe has this like Ratcliffe's law, which basically says when you have a good team, and you have a bad market, the market wins. If you have a bad team and a bad market, the market wins. And if you have a good team and a good market, then magic happens, right? Uh -huh. And, um, and it's, if you think about those three things, right? Product, market, and team, market is the only one you can't control. Right. Right? So that's what makes startups so hard is like there's the thing that you can't control is the thing that ultimately will determine your success. And so it's, uh, it's just one of those things that I think is you know, just really, really hard to do. So then how do you control the uncontrollable? <laughs> well, I think you have to have like an insight and you have to have like an insight that most people don't know. Right. So you lessen the amount of competitors that are like vying for that space. It's a bit of a paradox because I think a lot of people think that you should do the easy thing when you start a business or do the thing that you just like to do. Or, you, you know, like I like social media, I'm just going to build like a social media thing for pets or something. <laughs> I'm just making this up, yeah. but something like a little bit like that. But the, the fact of the matter is there's hundreds, if not thousands of entrepreneurs that are doing the same thing. Right. The hardest things, there's only a handful of people or nobody. Right. And so, and, and it's also where a lot of the value, if you can build this business will lie. And so I think um, you have to look into those segments. That's a good point. Um, sticking with that theme. So we sort of have like 
split in half your your years as you know um, an entrepreneur, and then you were the, the first part of your life, right? So the question is, I, I guess, how have the experiences in one life helped you in the other, if if at all? Well, I think you know, like your your career is is a is a part of your life, right? It's not just a, it's not just one particular job that you do, and so everything sort of carries over. What's interesting is like you know, I've been a startup person for the last decade. And now um, I'm at Microsoft of all places, right? It's the largest company in the world, yeah. right? And, right. Yep. <laughs> and so we are, um, like my role there is to run their entire payments group, which is, you know, it's a pretty big, it's a pretty, it's, it's just basically done at a different scale, yeah. right? And so it's like, I think we, we basically move the same amount of money as like the Singaporean GDP, you know, like half a trillion dollars annually. Um, and so, you know, the things that you learn as a founder are some of the things that I think are absent of a large company, right? Large companies, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say this is necessary of like Microsoft, but just more of a generalization that when you're at a big company, you have people who are, you know, they sort of stick to their roles. They're afraid to like venture out. They're not, they're, they're sort of um, incentivized to be risk, riskless, yeah, yeah. right? And as a founder, you're out there always pushing the edge. And so, you know, my mentality going into this particular role was to like, be more inventive, take some risks, um, and and you know find the best people and, and people who have an entrepreneurial spirit who wants to come in, who want to come in and also build alongside with me. You're like perfect at giving me these awesome segues because the next question was uh, a little bit about this, right? We we talked about it earlier, but let's dig a little deeper on this. You enter specific entrepreneurial pro with like, entrepreneurial opportunities with like objectives in mind. Do you embrace uncertainty and exploration, <laughs> or like you kind of mentioned that, right? Yeah, I mean, on, anyone here who's a founder knows that. Yeah, you, you, your day, your as you know, your day, your week, your hours as an entrepreneur are either like thrilling and ecstasy or despair. There's like no nothing in the middle. <laughs> And so like, you know, one hour I'm like, we're the kings of the world. Like we're going to go and be the next like whatever company. And then some bad news happens. And it's like, oh my gosh, like I'm an idiot. This company is going under. <laughs> and it happens so, so quickly. And so the emotional roller coaster you feel is immense. I'm sorry for your wife. Um, that's <laughs> this is why tough. you going yeah. back to like why yeah. I'm not running Lux. It's, yeah. you know, we have two small children. And yeah. so I think going through that roller coaster yeah, link a lot. and bringing them along. I think if it was just me, I, I would probably do it. Right, I'm right. A glutton for pain, but I think yeah, bringing them along, I think would be That's tough. a lot. Yeah. Um, let's stick with that theme, though. So you, you have kind of kept your foot in both sides of the world, right? Whether it's um, the startup world and the established high-performing companies. I think you sort of answered this, but why, why keep your presence in both spaces? Because uh, I love it. I mean... Um, you know, when you work with founders, it's like so, um, so raw, it's so real, you know, they're like, what I just talked about, you know, they're asking me questions, because they think that their company is going to die, they feel like they're going to be perceived as an idiot to the press to people, all their friends. And then, you know, you help them with something, and then they call you again, they said, Oh, my gosh, we just unlocked something. This is amazing. And so that sort of thrill that you get, working alongside people who are so mission driven, right? That's the other thing is like when you're at a startup, you have to be, you have to have a strong vision and a strong mission. And, uh, you know, at, at companies where you're just an employee, oftentimes people feel like they just go and they check in, yep. right? You, you go in, you clock in and then you clock out and you're more worried about, you know, what they're serving at the cafeteria or your vacation days, but like, it's not your passion. Fair enough. Um, let's talk about how you identify Co-founders. Mm. So you you met Chris Martin, co-founder of Lux, and Anish Basu, right, one of the co-founders of Pinwheel at Zynga. H how do you start to identify someone as hey, this guy could be or this woman could be a, a great co-founder? What, what are the qu qualities you look for? Yeah, like founding a company um, with your co-founder is probably the, one of the most important things you'll do as a founder. And and there's both the economic reason, which is that that's the most dilutive round you'll ever do, right? You're and oftentimes you're splitting the ownership of the company yeah. in equal parts, right? So you're giving 50% of the company or in, in the case of like two co-founders to somebody else. So you better make sure that you you get along with this person. It's not, it's not necessarily getting along. I should say it's more like, do you respect them? Do you value who they are, what they bring to the table? And are you complimentary, right? People oftentimes uh, talk about sort of the Silicon Valley 
duo, right, that they talked about, like Jobs and Wozniak or whomever, where there's typically a, a technical person and someone who is uh, a salesman. And that oftentimes, I think, works pretty well. But the best way, I think, is just to, like, work with somebody. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, there were people that I worked closely with. What about from a more human standpoint? So you're talking about like skill sets and that makes sense, right? Um, <clears throat> I guess this is sort of way like how you identify friends, right? Qualities you, you look for, human qualities, I guess, to take that dive with someone. Yeah, I mean, um, Warren Buffett talks about, he, he looks for like three traits when he invests in businesses or CEOs or founders. He looks for like intelligence, he, he looks for energy and then integrity. And, um, and I was thinking about that when I was reading, I was like, I didn't really think about those particular things, but ultimately those are the things that you want. And you need the third one, integrity, because if you just have the first two, right. then that person's going to run right. the company into the ground. I was going to ask you which one is the most <laughs> important one. It almost feels like you need the integrity. You, you definitely need the integrity. You need someone who is going to be there, but you also need a sparring partner, right? It's like getting married, right? You someone who you... You're not necessarily always going to, it's not always going to be rosy, but you'll, you'll fight, you'll argue, but you'll make up and you respect them at the end of the day. That's an interesting comment. So like we believe in newsrooms that difference of opinions um, are meant to be expressed and it leads to a more robust discussion and ultimately sharper editorial coverage. I, I guess you're sort of hinting at the same thing that having that conflict can ultimately lead to a better product. Yeah, and this is not just the founder thing. This is just how you run businesses, right? Which is, you know, good news always finds a way to travel, right? right. People love spreading good news. No one likes talking about bad news. Well, that depends. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in the news area, yeah. yeah. Sure, yeah. <laughs> but, but generally, right? People right. don't like talking about it. And right. the fact of the matter is, is like as a as a as an operator, as a founder, CEO, those are the things that you actually need to know. And so it's important that, you know, as a CEO, that you sort of sit back a, l a little bit and you let people tell you what's going on and you don't quickly come in and you say all the things that, you, that are on the top of your mind. Because if you do, you're going to influence the group to go in a different direction. And you always want to hear the bad news because the bad news will allow you to get better. So you try to pick people who would be strong enough and bold enough to give you that bad news despite... Yeah, right. and you could talk to my co-founders. I mean, we've gotten to pretty nasty fights, but never in a disrespectful way, but just around ideas or topics that we, we disagree on. And I think ultimately, you know, it allows me, if I believe in something, to sort of steel man my argument. And then for them, right. you know, I, it, it allows me to identify blind spots. Right. It sharpens, it sharpens, it sharpens your case. Mind. Right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. What advantages do you see in pursuing a non-entrepreneurial career path as you work towards becoming a founder? And how does this path contribute to your skill set? and readiness for entrepreneurship? Uh, so like, how do you... Yeah, I, I guess, you know, um, I, guess this, I guess this is sort of the same question, right? The non-entrepreneurial career and the fa becoming a founder, there's a different skills, it sounds like, right? Um, does one prepare you for the other? <laughs> Not at all. Is this just a almost big mess? Nothing, almost nothing prepares you to be a founder. Yeah, I kind of right? thought you'd say that. <laughs> you kind of jump in there. And, you know, I think the reason why all these startups exist is because, like, founders, especially first-time founders, have no idea how hard it is. Right. And so they kind of jump in there naively, and then they go and they figure things out. Um, but there are skill sets I think you, you tap into, right, okay. which is, like, you know, like your ability to analyze things, your ability to communicate and sell like selling is such a huge um, part of being an entrepreneur right. and it's nothing that colleges or even business school really tell you, uh, right. teach you. So it's all those things that sort of come into play. What can you teach us that business school doesn't teach us about selling then? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like think about selling, like think about being an entrepreneur, right? You're out there, you have an idea, you're selling to, you're selling to um, investors, right? Like yep. why should they spend any money or time like investing in your business? That's a sales thing. Right. If I'm trying to recruit you into my company and you have a high paying job at Google, why should you come and work at my company, right? And I have to give you ammo to then go and talk to your family about it, right? right? When I talk to a customer, it's all about sales. Like why should they use my rinky dink startup that nobody's heard, right? Mm -hmm. So it's constantly sales, 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 and, and um, they don't really teach you that or tell you that. And so, honestly, I wasn't the best salesperson, but you sort of learn how to do it. So I'm going to go back to sort of the human part of this, right? Because that's kind of what I do. It, it sounds like to me, if I put myself in your shoes in that moment where you're convincing a guy at Google to come work for you, it sounds like it's more than just selling him or her the job, but 
maybe something that they believe in, the human part of it, right? So talk to me about the human component. How do you make that connection? How do you even look for, I mean, I'm sure you don't want just anyone either, right? You're looking for, for someone with a certain human characteristic that you want to recruit. Yeah. What, what's making that connection like? Yeah, I mean, um, there's like missionaries or mercenaries, right? You want to find people who are missionaries, people who really buy into your vision, why, why you're personally excited. I think it's important that you actually, you yourself feel it, right? Uh-huh. And then you, they'll see whether or not you're actually into it or if you're there just to try to make money or do okay. something. And that's a mercenary. Yeah. Okay. And so you want to come in there, you want to have that excitement, and you want to sell them on the vision of what they do will actually change the world. Is it fair to say that you encounter way more mercenaries and missionaries along this journey? I mean, how does that shake out? I think you come across both. Okay. You come across both. But I think the people who tend to do startups are definitely more missionaries. Interesting. Okay. Um, For those in established careers waiting for the right opportunity to start their own ventures, what advice would you offer to, to them to avoid becoming too comfortable? I think you, <laughs> you have a lot of advice there. Yeah. And how have you maintained your entrepreneurial drive amid the stability of a traditional career? Yeah, it's something I've, I've thought about, you know, and like I've heard about this sort of model, which I think about quite a bit, which is, you know, if you're like a, a fund manager and you're young, right, you're advising someone who is young, you'll, you'll tell them to like go and be aggressive, You'll like put in the high beta funds, right? That will earn a lot of money. Why? Because if you lose your money, it's not a big deal, but you're going to have a significant amount of your life ahead of you where you can make enough money. When you're like retired and you, you know, and you're, you're, um, you just want to live a comfortable life. You're almost always in fixed income and because you can't stomach a, a market turn. And so it's almost like this linear curve. And there's a bit of a bump, I think, when that happens, when you have a family and you have a mortgage and kids and all that stuff. And so you should think about your career and the risk tolerance that you have similar to that type of model. You know, like when you're young is the time when you should be riskiest. Go and take a swing at things, right? If it fails, it's not a big deal. You're going to learn and you're going to get better. And and trust me, companies like Microsoft will reward you because they know that you went through that experience and that's the type of DNA they want in a big big company. But if, you know, you have kids and stuff and you really need to buckle down there, then maybe you push that off until you're an empty nester. Let's talk about you being Korean, because <laughs> you're at the Korean society, right? Uh, the underdog mentality. Um, Curtis Lin, the CEO and co-founder of Pinwheel, and previous team member at Lux Valet, referred to you as his role model, citing your leadership as an underdog mentality. Um, he mentions that the company's legal name, Underdog Technologies, embodies the mentality, and you're Korean-American. So <laughs> we all know what that means in terms of embracing that mentality. How has that shaped and driven your journey? Yeah, you know, Koreans, uh, obviously a lot of people here, like the Korean history is is one that's, you know, sort of enriched and littered with, you know, being colonized and then being one of the poorest countries and then digging your way out of that to become one of the most successful, you know, countries in the world. And so you sort of have that mentality of like, you'll do anything. Um, there's a great book by the, uh, by the founder of Hyundai, right? Chun Ji Hyung, where he talks about, this is a pretty interesting story, but he talks about, he went through all these different sort of, you know, phases where he started a business, it failed for whatever reason, then he, he had to start over from scratch and he kept on doing it. And so he, Hyundai was eventually, I think his like fourth company that he started and started off as an automobile, like business, uh, fixing business, motor business, and then turned into construction and so on. But he talks about this one story that I think is interesting, which is he was so poor, uh, he was working with a bunch of people, his coworkers at the time, he was so poor that they were sleeping in this like shack, effectively. And every time they went to bed, they would wake up in the morning with all these bites from bed bugs. Wow. <laughs> and so they, they thought, okay, like we'll be inventive and we'll figure out a way to make sure that we won't get bit by these bed bugs. And so they finally figured out a way to put these like uh, water buckets on each of the bed posts so huh. the bugs would go in and they would die. And so for a couple of days, like they're bite free. Huh. And, uh, and then by the third day, they woke up and they had all these bites on them again. He's like, what the hell is going on? How did this happen? And what he saw was that eventually these bugs got smart enough that they started going up the wall, going onto the oh, ceiling wow. and then dropping themselves down. Oh. And he tells that story because he says that, you know, 
to be an entrepreneur, you sort of, and Silicon Valley talks about the, the cockroach theory, like your job is to stay alive and do whatever it takes. Right. Right. And so I think that embodies a lot of like what the Korean culture is <laughs> Korean, about, yeah. right? It's just like, you got to go and you got to do everything you can to yeah. survive, right? And, um, and I think, you know, when you're running a startup, you have to think both inventive, but also with a mindset of, I'm not going to die. Like we got to, I got to do whatever it takes to make this thing successful. So I promise the organizers that I'm good with keeping time because that's what I do for a living. And I am like right on point, aren't I? I have one last question. I'm going to hit this mark. I'm impressed with myself right now. Um, maybe your wife should cover her ears right now. Um, look 10 years ahead. <laughs> cover your ears. Um, what do you see a vision for yourself 10 years from now? What aspirations do you hope to pursue in the future? Yeah, that's a good question. I think one of the points of reflection you have like that I went through after I sold the first company was like, what was it all for? You know, like I, um, I probably wasn't the best like dad at the time and like best father and, and best, um, husband. And you go through this reflection and like, you realize that ultimately what matters is like your family and, and like all of the accolades of like running a business, starting it and, and so on. It's great. But I think ultimately without a family in hand, it doesn't matter. And so for me, success in like 10 years really means that my kids are doing well and my family's doing well, my wife is doing well, and hopefully I'm just there along for the ride. I take that back. I hope you were listening to that. I, <laughs> to, yeah, <laughs> other direction. Um, we have some time for Q&A, right? Um, there's a microphone that's going to go around if anyone has a question. And we also have some virtual audience questions that already came in. We have one over here. <clears throat> Bed bugs. <laughs> Bed bugs. Yeah. I won't forget that story. Uh, thank you for your time. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, there's a startup right now actually do what what Hertz trying to do with you. It's called Kite. I'm not sure like where of them. Like if you mm. if you are aware, like what what do you think of that business model? <laughs> I think it's it's interesting. Um, you know, I think what's what's probably helped them that wasn't a thing. You know, a few years ago was the, the notion of like everyone wanting to be in their own private space. You know, I think prior to COVID, at least the talk around Silicon Valley was like Uber was going to crush car ownership, period. No one wanted to buy cars anymore. Your teenager will never have to get a driver's license. <laughs> and I think it's proven to be false. Uh, and I think COVID has been sort of the one of the one of the impetus for for doing that. And so, you know, I wish them well. Um, it's a tough business, though, I will say. I don't know what part of the stack they're in, whether they're, they're just the software or they're doing the entire thing. But if they're doing the entire thing, uh, Lord help them. <laughs> it's a tough business. Any other? There's one. Uh, thanks again for the talk. Uh, I was kind of curious about the dynamic of having three co-founders as opposed to maybe one or two. What does that look like in terms of your day-to-day -day and how you split up responsibilities? Yeah, you know, I've, I've done both, right? My first company had just another person, so us two, and then the, the second one had three. It's, um, I don't know, if you have like siblings, it's probably pretty similar, right? With, <laughs> with somebody else, just one other person, you know, it's like, I'm right, no, I'm right. And then there's, there's no tiebreaker there um, <laughs> often. But with a third, you know, the other person can oftentimes be that tiebreaker, like, oh, I actually think Stefan is right, not Curtis, right? And so uh, they bring a different perspective. Um, I think with that being said, though, like, you just have to, like, make sure that the dynamic is always right, because it gets trickier with the more people that you add, and you're divvying up more of the equity with more people. And so I think that can come back and, you know, for some people that I know, some companies I know, that can come back and bite them. And are there live questions? We have some virtual I can get to now. Yeah? Um, yeah, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, I'm an early stage startup founder, so definitely... I'm starting to feel the uh, the high highs and the, the low lows, like you mentioned. Um, but I came a little late, so forgive me if you answer this. But just curious, from the, your uh, you know first startup Lux to Pinwheel, what were the main things that you know you wanted to do differently as a second time founder versus versus the first time and lessons main lessons learned? Well, I think um, you know I talked about product, market, and team, right? And like market being the biggest one. And I, I think the biggest thing that I changed was just getting out of this like offline, online business, right? And not dealing with hard assets, not having to deal with people necessarily being sort of the determining factor of success, but more having to do with technology and, and allowing that to scale. 
And, you know, I think Pinwheel's been, um, it's been interesting, like it hasn't been like an up and to the right, you know, linear sort of journey, but we've gone through a lot of ups and downs, but we can actually, we can actually, because we're lean, we can actually weather the storm a lot better. And so I think that is probably the biggest thing. There are other truisms that I think we did um, as part of Lux that I would, that we continue to do, which is like, you got to control the things that you can control, namely the team like recruiting the best people possible is absolutely critical. Like that will give you so much leverage as a founder. Um, and, um, and then, you know, like just making sure you have like all the sort of processes in place and the things that are necessary to like build, build success. Uh, hello, you graduated from uh, Master Business Administration and there is also executive master business administration. And currently it cost quarter of a million from Wharton School or Cornell. And uh, I just look at the curriculum. Uh, you go one year and a half, or one time for per two weeks. And I just, you know, I, in education, I just cannot imagine how you can educate by this way young people. My impression is that this is a business just to selling uh, degree. Mm. What is your sincere, because you, you have chance to, to, to say That's for young people question. openly. Yeah. And I tell you, for my impression, this is like Trump University. Is it worth he it? Was is selling, question, right? He was selling lie. his real estate classes at the yeah. university yeah. for sixty, seventy thousand dollars 70000 It's a scamming young people. And I believe in any society to scam young people, it's a disgusting. Yeah. I think I don't want to make it specifically about Wharton. I think Wharton is a great school, <laughs> uh, but like education, like what is the what is the value of education, right? And even for undergrads, uh, but particularly for like grad schools like MBAs, right? And I think it depends. You know, I think I can only speak for myself, which is you know I I came from a business background, and I knew a lot of the fundamentals around finance and accounting and marketing, and so learning those again wasn't really that helpful. For me, it was really the, the network that you brought, uh, the network that you made when you were there, and then you know, some of the fringe courses and some of the trips that you go on and you meet people. And so you know, for me, I think the opportunity cost was higher. Um, but you know, for other people who are people who are like you know, with technical backgrounds, career switchers, there's a lot of people in the medical field, healthcare field who knew nothing about business. Learning about those things, those, uh, that curriculum was immensely helpful and allowed them to get their jobs that they wanted to. So I think it really depends. Um, I, think, um, I think, but it is, you know, people always ask me like about cost or risk, you know. What was that, quarter million? Yeah, and it's only getting higher, right? And so if, for those who have kids and you think about undergrad, I, I have this debate with my wife all the time, which is like knowing what we know now, like, does an undergrad education really... Well, let me, let me invert the question then, right? To, to rephrase this question, could you have done what you did without getting the MBA at, forget Penn, anywhere, right? The answer is yes. Yeah. And how would that have been different? Honestly, it probably would have been better in the sense that during those two years, forget the money, but I would have probably worked at a, a technology company. It's funny, one of the technology companies I was actually looking into instead of going to business school, was Facebook in 2005. If that was the case, I probably wouldn't be here. Right now. <laughs> right. Right. So I think, I think that's your answer, right? That's a good question. But you build a network by going to these big companies too, and that's, right. that's also really right. valuable. So it's sort of like I have a similar mindset, right? Like I look around in the newsrooms, and they didn't all go to the schools that I went to, and you, you kind of work your way up, and you build a network, and I wonder sometimes, was it all worth it? So yeah. There was a couple other questions here. There's one over here. Thanks for your time today. Um, I'm just curious to know, like, how do you manage your stress? Mm. How do you prevent you from getting overstressed or be overwhelmed by so much going on with having two kids, you know, working at the, you know, your workplace and so on? Is there a daily routine that you do? How do you spend your morning? Or is there something that you don't do? Yeah. Um, I'm curious. To 
Yeah, um, my wife will probably laugh at, at, at you because <laughs> I like, was looking right at her when he asked that question. I, uh, you know, as I pointed out, when I was running my company, I didn't really care about my health. Right? It was like full, you know, full tilt. Just who cares? Let's just worry about it later. And as I've gotten older and I've had a little bit more time, I've really thought about my health more holistically. Holistically, so I've been really thinking about how to like maintain a, a better health style, and it really has to do with building good habits. You've got to build good habits. And so like every morning I, I wake up and, you know, I um, sometimes I go and meditate. Sometimes I cold plunge. I do all the typical stuff that I think entrepreneurs do. But <laughs> y- you, you really have to do that. And then exercise. You know, I try to lift weights. I go running. Um, and then, you know, spend time um, journaling sometimes and thinking about all the stressful things and like actually getting it down on paper has been tremendously helpful. And uh, and you have to you have to spend time doing that. I mean, I think... Everything I said doesn't matter unless, you're, unless your health is in good shape. Right. Nothing, right? And so you have, to, like, you have to spend a lot of time doing that. And, and you'll think better, too. This is a follow-up question to that MBA question. Most, most famous entrepreneurs don't have MBAs, right? You know, whether it's Bill Gates or... Um, a lot of them don't have undergrad or, degrees. Elon Musk, <laughs> right, or they just, drop out, of, they just right. drop out of college. Yeah. So what's your perspective on that? Since you have an MBA, <laughs> I don't want you to rehash what you said, but is there, do you need, is, what's the value of going to have, what's the value of an MBA or education if you just want to be an entrepreneur? I think it depends on the person, right? Like you think about Mark Zuckerberg, or you think about Bill Gates or some of these people that dropped out of college, like let's not gloss over the fact that they went to Harvard, right? <laughs> and that they're like child prodigies, right? And, um, and so, yeah, they're, they always had the smarts, right? They, can, they, don't, they don't have to learn from textbooks to be smart. Um, whereas, you know, I think other people, I think there's a certain skill set you get. There's also just a maturity factor of like, are you mature enough, right? When you go and you try to lead as a, as a teenager or someone in your early 20s, you know, men and women who have been... S- experience like seasoned why should they go and work for you unless they see brilliance there you know i think that's the part that i think having good experience will help mitigate some of that i certainly wasn't ready (laughs) to go start a company at 18 or 19. thank you for your time today it's kind of a related question but you mentioned the emotional roller coaster and it's a long journey right it doesn't happen overnight so how do you keep that conviction in your idea? How do you keep believing in that specific idea? Yeah, you know, you have a lot of doubts. Uh, imposter syndrome, whether you're the right person for this. The thing that you don't, you never really should have doubts about is the vision and like what you want to accomplish. You might question whether you're the right person for it or whether you can pull it off. But I think if you think about things outside of yourself, right? If you're doing something that benefits people or benefits society, then that's enough like incentive for you to go and continue with the charge. The other thing I would say is like, when you're doing this by yourself or with a co-founder, you feel like you're the only one who's like in, in, in despair because like, what do you see on social media? You see like founders saying like, hashtag crushing it, like killing it. I just raised this big (laughs) round. I will tell you, like I joined a bunch of these, like it's like Alcoholics Anonymous for like founders, <laughs> where you go in, you have these circles, and you talk about what's going on in your business, and it is sad. Like people cry, people like get divorced, people like you know, there are panic attacks galore. It's just so much self doubt, and you realize that you're not alone. Everyone feels this way. Everybody. And so, so long as you know what you're doing and you feel like you have like a a greater sense of purpose, that's the thing that carries you because everyone goes to these troubles. First, first, thank you. It's fantastic. But I also want to praise you for really doing a good interview. Oh, thank you. (laughs) I know it's your job. Occupational hazard. (laughs) I wanted to ask, uh, you, you started, I think maybe it's a good segue from what you just said about corporate social responsibility or just more broadly. I mean, so you talked about your family. That's really important. Everyone agrees, undoubtedly. But I mean more broadly, first of all, is what you're doing socially uh, valuable? How do you view that? And then how do you integrate CSR into your companies? Thanks. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, yeah, I think certainly at Microsoft we do. It's like one of the core tenants that Satya has really kind of pivoted the culture of the business around. You know, when he took over, 
a lot of the stuff that we get evaluated on is whether we do have some CSR, uh, you know, mandates or things that we look for as part of the evaluation process. We also care a lot about DEI quite a bit. And so um, those are all things that if you don't measure it, if you don't care about it as part of the process, you'll never care about it really. Um, within, um, within Pinwheel specifically, we absolutely do, right? When we talked a bit about how the broken financial system exists. And, you know, when I think about that particular idea, I think about my parents, you know, they came to this country, they had decent jobs, enough, certainly enough to pay for a mortgage. But I remember going to like different banks and getting denied. Yeah. And it was just, you don't have the track record, you don't have the history. And, um, and so I feel like what we are doing is creating a fair financial system for people like my parents. Next question over here. Well, thank you for your time and thank you for sharing your valuable story. Uh, I, like, I've always like, wanted to become an entrepreneur and this year I decided to start one. Um, awesome. Like, let's say you have a cousin who wanted to become an entrepreneur and start a company. What advice would you give? I, I have no idea what am I doing. I'm building a <laughs> You're not alone. Yeah. <laughs> You're not alone. I mean, I'm happy to chat with you offline about all the sorts of different stuff. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. But I think, you know, sort of the thing that you should really think about, I think a lot of people, like, start companies because it's, like, almost people almost think of it as, like, playing house when you're a kid. Like, you want to be an entrepreneur, so you start a company. But the thing that that's sort of a fake way to go and start a company, right? The, the best way to do it is you dabble. You like know about a space, you're passionate about something, right? I'm passionate about music, I'm passionate about sports, I'm passionate about whatever. You get passionate, you learn a lot about it, and then you work on these side projects. And you, as you work on these side projects and you learn more about the industry, you realize all the different gaps that exist. And you and some other people, this is kind of how you go and date a co-founder before actually committing, you start to work on a project with them who have similar interests. And slowly, as you work on a particular project, that can morph into a company. And at that point, it feels better because then you know that there's something that is tangible. You know that there's a need. And from there, and you know that you have someone you can work closely with. And then you sort of snowballs from there. I think people inverse that. They, they kind of quit their job and say, I'm a founder. Yeah, yeah. They go and incorporate, and they have no ideas. They have nothing. And, and that's, I think, the absolute wrong way to do it. Date the co-founder before you marry them. Yeah, that's absolutely. Good advice. I, I have a follow-up question. Yeah. So you mentioned that you try to control what you can control. So as I get older in life, I've sort of adopted a motto where I try not to worry about what I can't control. Because mm -hmm. there's so much that you can't control. And, and my motto is you're just throwing away stress and energy on something that isn't going to control it anyways. Yeah. How did you get to a point in your life where you were able to let that part go? How do you identify first what you can't control? And what do you tell yourself to just not worry about it? Uh, it's hard. Yeah, I don't know if there's a right answer here, but I think it's like you com compartmentalize what you can, right? Yeah. There are things that, that are clearly tangible that are in front of you. It's, if I do this, then this will happen. If I don't do it, then it won't happen. So those are the things you sort of focus on and you, you work on it. The, the thing that um, I, I did and I still continue to do is I have like a hypothesis doc document. Of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> but you have like a series of like guesses, right? Hypotheses around like, I believe this could potentially be something. Right. And then what you try to do is you go through that list and you try to prove or disprove those things. I see. And what you'll realize is that there's a bunch of those things that you have no control over, right? As, so, you're, as you're going through As you're through going it. through like, why? Like, I'm not even going to bother about this. Interesting. But it's hard. I don't know if I have, I'm, I don't know if I'm best at that practice. Well, that's, that's one way to do it. Yeah. Anyone else in the audience? <laughs> you kind of have it half up. I'm going to take that as a yes. <laughs> Microphone over here, please. Um, thank you for tonight. It's been a very interesting and insightful talk. Um, my question goes back to your comment of when you were kind of rolling out of Lux and in that moment when you kind of had to let go of a lot of people that were with you for a long time yeah. that helped build the company. My question is more about the humanity side and the mm. compassionate side of after you spelt, spent all this time with these people and you have to let them go, when you finally get that deal, when you finally get that big sale or the funding, do you ever consider 
giving them some of it after they spent so much time and expected that yeah. outcome and being a part of it, but not being able to at the end. Yeah, I'll tell you a story um, pretty quickly here. When we went through one of these like changes, moving to a software-based business, we restructured the business. And as part of the restructuring, they, they changed the equity and whatnot. And um, my board said, Curtis, we want to continue to keep you, incentivize you. We'll give you this like equity package. And I said, what about for the rest of the team? And they're like, no, we're not going to give them. Like, they're, they have their existing package and then they have like, you know, their salary. And I, I knew that that just wasn't the right thing. So on my co-founder and I, on our own volition, they said, if you want to go change it, go ahead, but it's going to come out of your, your pocket. We said, fine, let's do it. So we ended up on our own volition taking our equity balance that the board had given us and we, we, we divvied it up for everyone in the company. So when we sold the company, everyone made a little bit of money, which was great. And I think, you know, if you think about your career, if you think about your life long term, that is the absolute, yes, it's like, it's ethically the right thing to do. But it's also, if you're just thinking about being greedy, right, monetarily, it's actually the right thing to do. Because like, if I hadn't done that, Kurt, who's one of my co-founders for Pinwheel, he was with me at my last company. He probably wouldn't have joined me. I, my reputation... Right. Would have been tainted. I was just going to ask you yeah. that if it paid itself back in a way. Correct me if I'm wrong. On your social media profile, you have like four words, kindness, right? Being one of them. Yeah. Is that fit into this way of thinking? It does. You know, I think um, you have to do what is like right and you have to think long term. And it's not just with like the direction of the business. It's with your life, right? You're a believer. I mean, I prescribe to this that the karma you put out in the world is what it kind of comes back. It feels like yeah. in that moment, it sort of came back to you. Right. Fair? Okay. Absolutely. I'm still good friends with all the people at the company and, you know, we help each other out and it's, it's great. I'm going to piggyback off of her question. Yeah. Um, I know we'll get to you. We have a little bit more time. I'm good on time right now. Um, you mentioned that when someone died mm. uh, at, at Lux, um, that the family sent yeah. a video which must have been just like excruciating to have to go through that emotionally. The question is, did you respond to the family? I did. Yeah. What? I'm, okay. Let me ask you. Okay, that's not this. That's not the answer I thought I'd get. Uh, let me ask you a follow up then. I would imagine liability wise, your legal team advised you not to. Yeah, I mean, we had to go through a lawyer to right. respond back to them, but we did. But you wanted to. It sounds like. Yes. That sounds risky. Yeah. Why did you take that risk, and what did you say in the response? Well, I think it's like when something like that happens, right? I don't think it's any fault of anybody's, right? It, it was kind of like a freak accident. But when something like that does happen and life is lost, I mean, I think the humanity of like responding to someone when they send you a video of their life, like yeah. their their mother's life, right? That like as she passed away, I mean, obviously it hits you as a person. And, um, you know, it's like you got into this business because you thought it was a great idea, but, you know... It, if you didn't do this business, would she still be alive? Mm. And you start thinking about all of these things in your head. And I think for me, it was an opportunity just to acknowledge their loss mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and do it in a, you know, hopefully in a, a graceful manner as much as possible. Did they respond to your response? No. Question back there, right? Thank you. Um, Kind of uh, another low light from your time at Lux, but <laughs> you got that Those phone call from Hertz ones. and uh, you use the word pivot and that's, that's only two syllables, but uh, can you walk us through maybe like the first 72 hours or the first week of, of getting, losing that Hertz deal? Like how do you problem solve from there? Yeah, I think there's a, it's sort of like uh, dealing with a loss, right? You go through the initial like different phases, right? First, it's like the shock, like this can't be real. And, uh, you know, actually, I, I found out about it even before he called me because oh. I was on a plane oh. and I was watching Bloomberg television and it scrolled. Oh. It says CEO, John, you know, of Hertz fired, like out. And so I knew something was wrong, but I couldn't call. And so then I, it landed in all these like, voicemails and stuff. So you deal with the initial shock and then you're quickly triaging. Uh, the thing about working at a company where there's sort of the offline online component where the bad, a lot of bad things would happen, right? I'd get phone calls at five in the morning, someone stole a car, a customer's car, uh, <laughs> oh, like, you know, vandalism, all sorts of stuff. Like it would, 
nonstop, right? And so I was kind of used to a bit of that. But you quickly go into triage mode, right? You sort of train. It's like, okay, I got to call these people. We got to figure stuff out, set up a board meeting. And you kind of work through the entire process um, all while inside. You know, people, my employees, that's the other thing. When you're a founder and CEO, everyone looks at you, right? And so, you know, like when bad stuff happens, they're just kind of peering around. They're looking at you because if you show fear, if you show like you don't know what you're doing, yeah. they're going to head for the exits. Yeah. And so you, you have to you have this air of confidence, like things are, things are going to be fine. You address the team, we're working through it. But inside, I'm like dying. I'm panicking. And this is where, you know, the embodiment of the stress just internally comes at you. Um, and I wish I had better, uh, I wish I had a better, like, habit or health system at the time, but I really didn't. This is like, by the way, not that unlike my world. Yeah. Um, I'm constantly sort of in crisis and deadlines and you just put sort of, it sounds like what you do. You put one foot in front of the other yeah. because you're not going to get to point B without taking that first step and the next step and you just control what's in front of you and you just have faith that you get to the end at some point, but also your demeanor, your countenance, your crew feeds off of that, right? So if I'm frazzled and I'm losing my mind, they're going to be all over the place too, right? So it, it sounds like a pretty good life lesson that's relatable to any yeah. sort of leadership role, right? I think we have time for two more. Is there anyone else? I have one. If, okay, there's good, because I got lots of questions. I can keep this going. Hi, um, thank you so much for um, the session today. So I actually do work at Uber, so it was kind of funny to <laughs> sort of hear some of your tidbits. But I think one question that I have for you is like how you kind of dealt with making difficult decisions that conflict, like kind of stood in conflict with like what your interest was as a CEO versus, you know, just as a person with empathy, like kind mm -hmm. of going back to the earlier, you know, kind of t topic that you were talking about, just like kind of leading with that human element because... I think the moral dilemma that I have at, at working at a company like Uber is like, you know, I, as an employee, my interest is to help the business like minimize costs and maximize our profits. But then as a human, I'm also like, I want to get, I also want to get the best deal from a ride, but then I also know that these are earnings for another person. Yeah. Right. So I imagine at Lux, you kind of probably had to go through that same decision of like, how do I maximize like my, my revenue, but then also sort of account for like another person that is working the valet and like, how do I decide what is a fair, you know, earning for, for, for that, for that person? Yeah. I think being a, being a, a leader, right. It doesn't matter what role you're in. Being a leader means that you sometimes have to make very unpopular decisions. I think a lot of inexperienced founders go into a company wanting to be loved, wanting to be liked. And so they'll refuse to make these tough decisions, even though it's better for the company. Um, now, there are things within on the fringe where it's like sort of neutral for the company. And I think that's where the reflection of the, the founder really comes into play. Because if you have a founder who is like greedy, they will scrape and take every last morsel, whereas there's others who are more generous uh, around the fringes. But ultimately, at the end of the day, like you realize when you start a company, you know, the fiduciary responsibility of a CEO is to like run the business and that you yourself, even as the founder, like you're not above the company. It's like there's shareholders, there's investors, there's the board, there's you, and then there's all the employees. So you have to do what's, re what's best for the, uh, for the greater good. You have the last one? Because I have the last one if you guys don't have one. Okay. Hey, uh, thanks so much for your time and insights today. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty early on in my career. I've or actually only worked at one startup, brought it from like five. I've helped it bring it from five people to like 30 people. But I have always wondered what's on the other side where you work at a bigger kind of corporation. What type of different learning and kind of growth opportunities do you see as a main difference? They like Microsoft specifically or like the companies? It's different. I mean, you're like operating at a different scale. Like a billion dollar business at Microsoft is like, that's nice and cute. <laughs> like <laughs> eventually it'll be like an adult business, right? And whereas obviously like anywhere else, that's a huge, huge business. And so like you just operate at a different scale. There's a bigger target on your back being a bigger company. There's tons and tons of competitors. But at the same time, you know, the thing about working at a big company is that whether you work there or you do something, the company will continue to move forward and will continue to succeed. It's like default 
especially if it's a successful company, default to be set to be successful, right? Year after year, week after week, you'll just be better and better. When you're at a startup, it's like default decline. So if you do nothing, you'll just continue to go worse, 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 worse. And so um, it's a different mentality. It's like, I have to go and prop this thing up on one end. And the other one is like, you, you want that mentality at a big company, but it's not as crucial. I'm going to end with one because I can. And I'll make, it, I'll make it fairly easy to answer, I think, right? And something I think we can all hopefully get something out of. Mentorship. I, I imagine it's safe to assume that you had some mentors along the way. Um, but here's the question, right? So I have some mentees that have, a, have some difficulty identifying the difference between a mentor and someone who's, I guess, posing as a mentor and is really just more of a transactional relationship. How do you identify, how did you identify mentors in your life and what advice would you give for the audience on how they should sort of seek mentorship? Yeah, it's a great question. I think there's a lot of charlatans, like people who like claim to be angel investors and they want to help you out. But then quickly the conversation goes into like, how much are you going to pay me? Mm -hmm. Right. If anyone asks for you to pay them for advice, just advice, like run, right? right? Run on the other side. <laughs> like, I think if you find someone who has a legitimate interest, shared interest in what you're building, you know, gets to really know you, doesn't go in there looking for a handout. Right. And you feel like you, they provide so much value that you feel like you need to give them something. That's when you really find a good, good mentor. So closing note, I would say uh, a mentor is someone who would help you even, at, even if it's at odds with their own interest. Yeah. I've had some mentors who would help me even if it hurt them. And that's, to me, the definition of a good mentor. Now, there is uh, a couple of housekeeping notes here as I wrap this up. I promise when I finish talking, there's food and beverages, okay? But we have to thank the right people. So thank you first, obviously, for, to Curtis Lee. Can we get a round of applause for him? That was awesome. Um, and to the Korea Society and Hanwha Life for organizing this event. And to all of you guys in the audience, um, you guys are great questions, seriously, great questions. Um, if you want to see it over, it's on the YouTube channel. If your friends missed it, you can send it to them. Um, if uh, you're interested in becoming a member of Career Society, stay connected with upcoming programs uh, all through the social media. And there's, um, there's a whole team back there with all this information, how you can get involved. Uh, save the date for Wednesday, May 1st. Career Society hosts startup scenes inaugural forum at city headquarters. That sounds cool. Uh, the inaugural forum will discuss the impact of AI technology in the startup ecosystem with the title Changes, Challenges, and Chances in K Startups Among AI Era. That's a mouthful. You guys need some journalistic uh, advice here. Um, that doesn't roll off the tongue. Uh, so anyway, um, at the end of this, as I said, there's refreshments and food in the back. Uh, the meal tonight's provided by Ongi. And alcoholic beverage options are also available. Don't drink and drive. Get home safe. Um, and thank you. You can hang out till 8. Uh, he'll be around. I know you have questions. So thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, man. That was awesome. Stay in touch, man. That was awesome. Yeah.